right, so finally, at long last, we're ready to put together the full uh, Schrodinger equation, I'm sorry, the full wave function for the hydrogen atom. So what we've managed to do so far is after separating the variables, after deciding that our wave function might be a product of a radial piece and an angular piece, one that depends on only r, one that depends on theta and phi, we discovered that that does indeed solve the, Sch the Schrodinger equation. The angular piece was familiar to us from the rigid rotor, so it has the same form as the rigid rotor wave function. The radial piece, after some work, we decided was a normalization constant times some pieces that uh, look like polynomials in R times a decaying exponential. The radial piece depends on these two quantum numbers N and L. Uh, the angular piece depends on the quantum numbers L and M. So let's summarize real quickly what we know about those quantum numbers. Again, the value of n can be any non-negative integer, uh, I'm sorry, any positive integer, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Um, the name for that quantity is the principal quantum number. The value of L we've seen can run from 0 up to n minus 1, but cannot be larger than that. That one is called the angular momentum quantum number. And lastly, m, which we haven't talked about recently, but has the same meaning as it does for rigid rotor wave function. We know from the rigid rotor that can range from L, uh, from negative L all the way up to positive L, and that one we call the magnetic quantum number. So uh, the next thing we'll do is write down the full form of the wave function which depends not only on L, but also in the N and M. So for any, combina any valid combinations of these quantum numbers, Ns and Ls and Ms, we can write down one of these uh, wave functions. So what I'll do next is I'll write down those wave functions for several values of N and L and M so we can see what they look like. So that collection of uh, radial Schrodinger equation wave functions looks like this. Clearly they can get very complicated. But the point is, we can calculate all of them if we just know uh, the equations for how to calculate the radial and the angular portion, and we multiply them together. So if we look at these, I'll just point out a few key features. Number one, each one of these NLM wave functions uh, has a normalization coefficient out front, and those normalization coefficients are uh, different in principle for every one of these uh, wave functions. That's just whatever the value needs to be so the wave function becomes normalized. Uh, also notice that the normalization coefficient itself always includes the z over a naught to the three halves term. That's there primarily for unit reasons. The normalization coefficient um, needs to uh, have units of one over uh, length to the three halves so that um, the units of the wave function are appropriate. After the normalization coefficient, in the radial portion of the wave function, we may have uh, some terms that look like zr over a naught or maybe zr over a naught raised to, uh, with some coefficients in front, uh, raised to some power. And again, that n in the denominator uh, is, that value of the constant in the denominator corresponds to this n value. The power it gets raised to corresponds to the l value. There's also some polynomial portion of the radial uh, part of the wave function that might be relatively simple. It might be relatively complex, or it might be in some cases invisible because you're just multiplying by one. And again, that's the generalized Laguerre polynomial um, that we can evaluate for any particular value of n and l. There's also always this exponential piece, e to the minus zr over one or two or three a naught, depending on the value of n for this particular wave function. And then comes the angular term. So we might have no angular dependence at all when l equals zero. We might have a cosine theta or a sine theta uh, when L is equal to 1. Or when L equals 2, we might have some uh, second order uh, polynomial and cosine theta that are somewhat familiar to us from when we studied the rigid rotor. And lastly, uh, we have a term sometimes that looks like e to the i phi or e to the minus i phi, e to the 2 i phi or e to the minus 2 i phi, and that depends on these, these values of m. 
So uh, when L is non-zero, M can also be non-zero, and that results in a, in a complex uh, wave function that has this imaginary term on the end. So there's no need to memorize these. You can always look them up whenever you need. But the point is, now that we've uh, written down the general form of the solutions to Schrodinger's equation for the hydrogen atom, we could write them down on demand for any n and l and m we wish uh, whenever we want to.